of all, uh, you know, thanks, uh, Tareen, Rachel, for, for putting the paper on the program. I also wanted to say thanks for everyone who's involved in organizing STAG. I know that Doug and Joe are here, but there's obviously many more people involved. I think for everyone interested in the structural transformation, this is a really a great thing to have this community. And the, the next, next couple of weeks in September, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to seeing many of these papers. So this is a paper on... Um, on services and service-led growth. It's joined with Fabrizio, who's, who's here, who's going to answer questions, and Tian Yu Fan, who's a PhD student at Yale, who can't be with us today because he's in China and there it's like 4 a.m. or something. Um, and so this is about uh, productivity growth and services in India. So, um, you know, as we've seen uh, already in many papers, in particular in, in the last one from Turin, so services play a very large and in particular very growing role in poor countries today. Right? We've seen this evidence from Malawi that uh, from 1960 to 2018, essentially the big increase in employment is in services. And there, Malawi is by no means an exception for most developing countries today. Services are important and keep growing so. And I think the you know, traditional view in the literature um, is that somehow this expansion of the service sector is what we sometimes would call like a corollary of development. I'm going to put income effects here, right? The, the usual story that non-homotheticities drive service demand and drive service employment, but really it's sort of an afterthought, an afterthought of growth whereby productivity growth takes place in agriculture, in goods producing uh, industries, and then demand follows. And so what, what we want to do in this paper is we kind of wanted to think about whether that view is actually true or whether there might be an important role in productivity growth in services. I think in the cross section, you know, Tareen already mentioned that there is something about, you know, value added in services to the extent that we can measure it being even higher in agriculture. And so we, we think there is an important role potentially for productivity growth. And, and we think that's very important for, for development in macro, because if, we're, if we think about this view of the world whereby service employment is a corollary of growth, there is this notion that by maybe missing out off on manufacturing employment, you know, many poor countries today are sort of missing out on growth opportunities, which other countries in the past had, while if we find an important role for service and uh, for productivity growth in services, that worry might not be warranted. So what do we do in this paper? Well, first, we kind of have to think about how do we actually try to measure service productivity? Right? And so just trying to measure service productivity from the data is notoriously difficult, right? It, it's very hard to find good data on it. There's the usual problem of about value added and final expenditure, unobserved quality is probably an even more, uh, even more of a problem than in manufacturing, uh, manufacturing products. And so, you know, trying to measure services directly from the data is going to be difficult. Finally, or secondly, Precisely because we think that non-homotheticities non are, are present, it's also difficult to go from changes in quantities directly to changes in, in prices or changes in productivity precisely because we don't know whether, say, this increase in demand for services comes from an increase in income or a reduction in prices or an, an increase in productivity. And so the way in, in this project we want to try to get around this is that we use like a, 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 an approach which we think is akin to development accounting. We're gonna call it equilibrium development accounting because it, not, it doesn't only require a particular production function as in the, as in the tra traditional development accounting literature, but we need to uh, have a little more structure where we use this equilibrium condition. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put structure on the whole problem. We're gonna use data on employment, on expenditures and some theory. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you that, you know, with using these kind of equilibrium conditions from the theory, we can measure productivity growth in broad sectors in the economy. In particular, we're going to measure productivities in services, in agriculture, and manufacturing for about 400 districts in India. Uh, and, uh, and that will allow us to try to use that model to quantify the role of the service sector productivity growth for economic development. So uh, what do we find as a preview of the results? So, in this project, we're going to focus on India. We're going to focus on India because India, I think, is, a, is, a, is, is an interesting example to start with. It's an interesting example because it has seen, obviously, lots of growth between 1990s or the late 80s and, and today or the, the, the 2010s. It's, an, it's a country which kind of satisfies this criterion that it didn't really go through a big manufacturing expansion, but mostly saw an increase in services. And so what we find for India is uh, three things. I'm going to show you all three of them in this, in this talk today. First, 
we're going to uncover very large spatial differences in consumer service productivity. Right? So what we find is that, that some locations, in particular urban locations, are particularly productive in consumer services. And by consumer services, I'll be more precise about this later. Think of this as like retail, childcare, services which consumers directly consume. And we think that's important because it's not only the case that consumer service demand is high in Delhi because people in Delhi are rich, it seems to be that there's something about the consumer service sector in Delhi, which seems particularly productive and can, and can deliver a high quality good at a relatively low price. Secondly, we're going to find that consumer services are much more important than producer services. Again, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to talk about the data in a second. For now, think about consumer services, retail, childcare, et cetera. Producer services is an input into production. Think about this maybe as consulting, finance, lawyers, et cetera. So in the Indian context, we find that consumer service are much more important. The main reason is that when we look into the data and try to measure consumer and producer service employment in a careful way, we just find that quantitatively, most of the people in the service sector work in what we would attribute to consumer services, not so much in producer services. And then finally, when we ask about the time series implication and ask, you know, to what extent is consumer service growth between 1987 and 2011 important for the aggregate? We find that, uh, the, that consumer service productivity growth is actually quite important. In particular, it's going to be, it's, uh, it, it has important effect on welfare, in particular in large cities, which are um, you know, really specializing on these services. And we're also going to show that it accounts for a large part of structural change in the sense that if consumer service productivity in India had not grown between 87 and 2011, agricultural employment would have been much higher service employment which would have been much lower, right? So there seems to be a direct effect of productivity growth in services on the structural transformation. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to cover in these uh, remaining minutes uh, three topics. I'm going to kind of sketch the theory which we're going to use to use our accounting procedure. It's basically a spatial trade model uh, where we have multiple regions, which are going to be these 400 districts in India. And non-homothetic preference is going to play an important role as do relative price effects. Um, an important assumption which we, which we impose on the problem is that we think that like a generic feature of services is that, not, that they're not going to be tradable, right? So these consumer services, they're going to be locally provided and that's going to deliver us, uh, put like tight restrictions to the extent that we can infer productivity of consumer services in a particular location and their employment share. In terms of data, our main data set uh, are these national sample surveys from, the, from, from, from India. Think about this as census. We have multiple cross sections of them and the type of information which we get from these censuses are the number of people in each district, the employment share in each district, average wages in each district, and the distribution of human capital, which we measure through the uh, distribution of schooling across districts to measure you know, the supply of human capital in each particular location. We're going to use these employment shares to attribute employment to broad sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, producer services, and consumer services. And so to do this uh, assignment, I'm not going to have time in this short presentation to talk about all the details, but you know, I'm very happy to talk about this after, after the talk. Uh, for agriculture and manufacturing, most of the time that's relatively clear coming from the um, coming from the information in the National Sample Survey, to attribute people to producer versus consumer service, we use a combination of both the occupational information in the National Sample Survey and a new data set, the survey of service firms, so we can observe whether ser service firms sell to firms or directly to consumers. And so using this data together with the NSS, we can basically calculate employment shares in producer and consumer service firms across districts in India. And then finally, we're going to use these two ingredients, the theory and the data, to do our equilibrium development accounting, uh, which, I'm, which I kind of highlighted before. Now, for this presentation, I'm going to only show you the examples, uh, the results for the closed economy. In the paper, we have an extension with trade, in particular trade in ICT services, call centers, et cetera. I can already tell you that the results are not going to be very different, but what, I'm go what you're going to see in the next 20-something minutes is only going to be the closed economy. Okay. So here's kind of the basic data pattern which motivated most of our study. So what you see here on the left is the sectoral employment shares for these four, three sec uh, four big sectors in 1987 by quintiles of the uh, urbanization rate across districts. On the right side, you see the same patterns in 2011. 
you know, these are very similar in spirit, actually, to what we've seen in this earlier paper uh, um, uh, about Malawi. What you see there is first in the cross section, there is a there's a big decline in agricultural employment shows by urbanization rate as expected. There's a big increase in, in service employment shares, manufacturing employment shares by urbanization rate as expected. Now, what's interesting when you're looking through the time series is that first you see this big decline in agricultural employment, which India went through from 87 and 2011. And you also see that essentially the, the, the only category which kind of went up to absorb all these workers from agriculture are consumer services. In particular, the manufacturing employment share is essentially constant. Right? And so what we're going to ask is if these patterns tell us something about productivity growth and services, in particular, are these reflective of productivity growth and services? And if so, is this important for, for growth and welfare? Okay, let me quickly uh, highlight sort of the main ingredients in the theory. We're going to have our regions, we're going to have three goods. So consumers are going to eat three things, food, goods, and consumer services. Producer service is not something which consumers eat directly. Rather, they're an input into the production of goods and combined with, say, the output or the value added of production workers. There's a single factor of production. So, um, you know, we're going to abstract from the, the human role and we're going to think about people as a, how did Tomas, you put it as a commodity. So labor is a commodity which is freely substitutable across sectors. It's an immobile across space. And, uh, and we're going to have competitive and, and frictionless market at each point in time. And we're going to think about these different time periods as, you know, snapshots from a static model. On the technology side, everything is essentially linear in human capital and, and with concerns of scale. For food and consumer services, these are production functions which are directly in value-added terms. The type of objects which we're particularly interested in are these productivity measures, ARFT, ACST. So this is you know, the productivity of labor in region R in, in food production and agriculture, the productivity in region R of consumer service production. Um, um, uh, and exact consumer service production. Now, for goods, I'm not going to have time to talk about this in detail. For goods, we take a little bit of a more complicated approach. In particular, for goods, we have a more micro-founded model of how production takes place, where firms use both production workers and producer services, think about these as lawyers to produce. And so what we show in the paper is that, you know, the equilibrium of that sort of industry equilibrium uh, implies that the, that the aggregate production function for goods is akin to a linear production function in total employment and producer and manufacturing services, where this, uh, where this aggregate productivity term, ARG, the productivity of goods production in region R is endogenous. It depends explicitly on the TFP in manufacturing producer services, but importantly for us, it doesn't depend on equilibrium prices, but only in terms of parameters. So for most of what I'm going to show you today, you can think about this goods term as essentially a primitive and you know, the relative allocations of workers into manufacturing and producer services are going to allow us to tease out how much of this comparative advantage in the production of goods is due to having good lawyers, having good producer services, or having a, a relatively efficient manufacturing sector. Now, on the preference side, we're going to follow um, this recent literature. Uh, you know, Timo has work on this, uh, who uses these uh, preferences from, from Milbauer and this pickle class. Um, so these pickle class preferences are, are uh, parametrized by this indirect utility function, which you see here on top. Uh, what's more important for us is, and you can focus right here at the bottom, that what these preferences imply, they imply, um, you know, very well behaved expenditure shares for these different sectoral goods. So how do these expenditure shares look like? These expenditure shares have both non homotaticities and price effect. In particular, they have these kind of following almost like log linear structure, whereby this income elasticity epsilon is going to play kind of an important role, in particular if consumer services are luxury, then we are in a situation where this kind of parameter nu is negative and where this uh, elasticity epsilon is positive. So rising incomes, they increase the expenditure share on consumer services, vice versa for agriculture. And we're going to be finding that this parameter is negative. So rising income takes uh, expenditure out of agriculture. So why do we take this Pigel class? We take this Pigel class for three reasons. First, um, they're relatively easy to estimate in particular you know, we have like three parameters to kind of parameterize these non-homotaticities. Secondly, 
This is a model with heterogeneous agents in the sense that there are multiple regions which have to interact on these, uh, in these trade linkages. And so what these pickle preferences buy us that they have very nice aggregation properties. In particular, as we show in the paper, we can essentially write this model as a representative household within each region. Finally, we're interested in the welfare properties. And so what these pickle preferences also allow us to do is they allow us to derive relatively easy to evaluate expressions for kind of regional welfare, which we take as, sorry, which we take as the um, expected utility or expected indirect utility within a region. Now, given this demand system, we can write down the equilibrium and this equilibrium is basically characterized by three types of equations. There's going to be a trade equation for foods and goods, both of which are tradable. Total income is equal to total, de uh, total uh, demand. Um, uh, there's for consumer services, I said, consumer services are non-tradable. So there we, equilibrium requires that local expenditure on consumer services is equal to local employment. And then finally, there's, there's a labor market clearing condition in each location. And these equations exactly pin down all the equilibrium's outcome, in particular wages and labor allocations. So how do we perform a quantitative exercise? So what we want to do is we want to rationalize this data at the spatial level as an equilibrium through the choice of three things. Right? We need to choose some preference parameters. We also have to choose some technology. These technologies are part of this kind of industry equilibrium with the producer service sector, which I didn't show you. So these are kind of colored in a light gray. So you've only seen these guys here. So we need to get numbers for these preference parameters. Then we can use the equilibrium conditions of the model to figure out what these productivity terms in, all, in each of these sectors in each of these regions looks like. And finally, we have to take a stand on what local, the local supply of human capital is. So how do we do that? On the local supply of human capital, we do it in the classical development accounting procedure. We estimate Mincerian returns in the cross section. We use the spatial distribution of school attainment across districts to predict how much human capital supply each district has. What about these preferences? We do a mixture of calibration and estimation. And so um, let me highlight these when I, when, I, uh, when I show you the numbers. So these are the parameters which we take and, and the three which we estimate. And the three important ones are, are these three which are colored in red. First, this income elasticity is obviously important to govern the extent to which income effects can drive up service employment. So we, um, uh, we estimate these angle curves from the cross-sectional expenditure pattern of food. And so the basic idea, and maybe let me just click on this for a second, I can show you this. Um, so our model implies that the expenditure share on food is basically a log linear function of an aggregator of log prices, which depends on the regional level and expenditure at the micro level. And so what we can do in the Indian data, the Indian data does not only have employment information, but the Indian data also has expenditure information. And so we can use this in a simple regression where we essentially run individual food, food uh, expenditure shares on a region fixed effects, which kind of summarizes all these effects on prices uh, and log income and the coefficient here basically gives us an income elasticity. Now in practice, we do it a little more complicated because you know, this kind of intercept term is not exactly zero, it's small, so we do it with indirect inference, but here you get sort of the, the intuition. And so, you know, importantly, these income elasticities are disciplined from the cross-sectional uh, spending elasticity of rich and poor household within a particular location. So finally, what else do we estimate? Well, we estimate that um, you know, services are a luxury good. We estimate that, uh, food, or, or, uh, that, that food is a necessity. And these, impl these imply also that goods or manufacturing or tangible goods are also a slight luxury, a little less of a luxury than, uh, than consumer, service, uh, than consumer service, service employment. So rising incomes, increased spending on goods and increased spending on consumer services. So, Given all these, uh, uh, this kind of machinery, let me show you four results today, what, what, what we do with this machinery. So first I'm gonna show you how does, how, does, uh, how does the model infer consumer service productivity across space? Secondly, what are the aggregate welfare effects of sectoral productivity growth, right? So the second one is, you know, what would have happened to welfare in India, aggregate welfare in India, if uh, there hadn't been any growth in say agricultural productivity, if there hadn't been any growth in manufacturing productivity and vice versa. 
Third, I'm going to show you the distributional effects of consumer service growth, in particular, the extent to which rural versus urban locations benefited more or less from this expansion in the product, uh, production possibility set for consumer services. And finally, I'm going to show you to what extent productivity growth in consumer services might have caused part of the structural transformation in India. So here's the first fact about the spatial heterogeneity of consumer service productivity. So, right? so what our model finds is that when we estimate these uh, local productivity terms of consumer services and plot them against the urbanization rate, we find a relatively, uh, you know, relatively tightly estimated increasing relationship. Right? So this is a bin scatter plot for 100 quantiles of the urbanization rate distribution. Conceptually, you, would, you want to think about each of these dots as like a region. So what we do find is that more urban places are estimated to have higher consumer service productivity. So why is this important? You think it's important because it sort of highlights that for a place like Delhi, Bangalore, et cetera, you know, having high consumer service productivity itself might be a cause of why people are better off and is not only a pure income effect. What about the macroeconomic aggregates? So what you see here is the result of four counterfactuals whereby we basically restrict productivity in agriculture, the green line to be constant since 1987. We restrict consumer service productivity to be constant at the level of 1987 in orange, manufacturing in light blue, producer services in dark blue. So the first thing that you should be taking away from the slides, this is at least what we were in some sense more surprised about, is that Productivity growth in consumer services is really important for aggregate welfare. In particular, it's about the same order of magnitude as productivity growth in manufacturing. Now, the most important source of welfare growth for an economy in India, we still estimate to be agriculture, which in some sense shouldn't be so surprising because in this time period in 1987, there's about you know 70% of people in agriculture. This declines quite rapidly to 2011, but still you know, most of employment is in agriculture that you would think productivity growth in that sector should account for the most chunk of, of growth and it does, but uh, consumer services are really important, you know, roughly at the same order of magnitude as productivity growth in manufacturing. You see here that for producer, producer services, the aggregate welfare changes is, is almost negligible, mostly because these quantities are so small. So this is, um, this is aggregate welfare. So um, to what extent are these welfare losses maybe more or less pronounced in some regions or others? What I show you here is the same result for different quintiles of the, urban, uh, of the urbanization rate. So what does this show? For each quintile of the urbanization rate, we show you here in, in, in gray, the level of welfare in 2001. Right? As you would expect, it's increasing in urbanization, in, in urbanization simply because you know, people in the data, people in urban locations are richer, are more educated, et cetera. Now the orange lines are the average welfare by quintile if consumer service productivity had not grown since 1987. The thing which you know, is the most striking one is that you know, the, really the most changes are here in the fourth and fifth quantile of the urbanization distribution. So the way we interpret this is that productivity growth and consumer service is really kind of a city phenomenon which, made, uh, which, which increased welfare in cities substantially for less urban places. You know, the effect is mostly positive. Uh, you, know, you see this slight thing here in the third quintile, which I'm happy to talk about uh, in, in the discussion, but it's, 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 much, um, it's much smaller, right? So cities are the places in India which seem to have benefited the most from increases in consumer service productivity. Finally, to what extent can this increase in productivity growth and consumer services be related to structural change at the aggregate? Well, again, we find effects which are quantitatively quite important. So what does this graph show? It again calculates an equili and counterfactual equilibrium where we hold consumer service productivity constant at the, at the level of 1987 and calculate, recalculate all the quantities. And what you show is the change in the sectoral employment share. Green is against agriculture. Without increases in consumer service productivity, agricultural employment would not have declined as much. In, if, in, in fact, it would have been 10 percentage point higher. Consumer services, 
exactly the opposite. Would have been 10% lower, you find very little effects on manufacturing and producer services. So, you know, what kind of this data on this model kind of implies or suggests is that growth in consumer services cost reallocation out of agriculture, not so much out of manufacturing. So why is it that consumer services has this big effect on agricultural employment, not so much on manufacturing employment? You know, our estimation kind of tells us that there's basically two reasons for why consumer service productivity growth has this, let's call it like anti-agricultural bias. First of all, without productivity growth in consumer services, people are poorer. And if people are poorer, they tend to go into more agricultural goods. That tends to increase the agricultural employment share. Secondly, you know, the spatial aspects of the distribution of economic activity matters here precisely because we see a much more, uh, much more concentrated degree to which manufacturing products are specialized. It's easier to move people into the agricultural sector relative to the manufacturing sector because goods are tradable, right? And so, uh, so this is the structural change factor. So I'm almost done, so let me conclude. So what this paper really set out to do, our, our most, most interest was thinking about, you know, are poor countries today doomed if people end up in retail employment or is there hope? Is there some sense to which service productivity growth in service sector can be, can be real and can be basically a cause for development and can sustain growth in the long run? Now to do this, we use theory and data. And the, the reason why we need both so intensely is that we need both to try to separate demand income effects from productivity growth originating in the service sector. We applied this to India. In principle, one could do this for other countries and would be very interested in doing so. But in India, what we do find is growth in the consumer services was very important. It was very important for the aggregates, both for welfare and for the process of structural change and seemed to have particular kind of spatial biases whereby cities seem to have been the main beneficiaries of this process. Now, um, as with many accounting papers, I think what we found out here is that uh, that, that there is, that there's, you know, that the data seems to be consistent with the view of the world for productivity growth and services is real. Now, this paper does not have anything to say about what it exactly is and that it also makes it, you know, not very amenable to say policy discussions on what could we do for a rural region in India to be richer. Now, um, you know, what Fabrizio and I and some others really wanted to think about in the future is trying to think about what are the determinants of productivity growth in the services. And, you know, not only because of the title of this session, but in general, you know, we think that marketization and the division of labor into the service industry is probably one of the most, uh, um, you know, intuitive reasons why productivity growth in services uh, could have been so large in India. Okay, that's, that's it. I think I'm basically out of time. So, let me just open up the floor to uh, to discussions and um, and obviously you know Fabrizio while being here uh, he he should also answer if he if he feels like it. There are actually three questions. I think it's better oh. uh, if there is. So uh, uh, from Julieta, from uh, Rachel, I think Rachel has two questions, and from Tarin. Let's let's hear them. Perfect, Julieta. Hi. Uh, very interesting paper. I, I just had a, a kind of a, a question basically motivated with how you started the paper saying, or the motivation to the paper saying, look, we have seen the latest kind of versions of structural change that we have seen seem to suggest that there is no industrialization stage or that the industrialization stage is shorter, right? So one hypothesis is that really what is happening is that all those low skill jobs that before were kind of supplied or were standing there by the manufacturing sector, are really being uh, created now by low skill services. So my question was, okay, what's the, to what extent this thing that you're calling, uh, you know, uh, consumer services map really one-to-one -one into low skill services? That's an empirical question. And then uh, more like a bigger picture question is, do we think that the reason why these um, consumer uh, services are so important is because that's where the low skill services are and that's where it's easier for people that are moving from the rural area into an urban setup uh, it's easier for them to find those jobs given their skills Fabrizio do you want to answer or I could also yeah I can, I can take my first shot no sure yeah uh, there are many interesting aspects in your question so the first is the modeling choice so we do not have uh, some type of uh, 
comparative advantage of skill across sectors. So we have decided yeah. to extract from them. We account for that, but uh, so you know, when we look at the the uh, earnings, we translate that in efficiency unit, but under the assumption that there is perfect substitution. That's to clarify the the the, the, the theoretical uh, uh, structure. So in some way, if uh, the story was the one. Uh, uh, Tommaso has uh, emphasized, we would miss it, to, to be completely frank and honest. Second point is, uh, empirically, it's not the case, uh, somehow to our own surprise, that these consumer services are so low skill. In fact, it's higher skill on average than manufacturing. I mean, it's a bunch of different activities, and certainly some of them you would expect uh, 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 skills are, are less important than in others, but somehow, uh, if we had that mechanism we don't have, that would somehow take part of the merit of what uh, you know we, we attribute uh, uh, to uh, uh, technical progress in consumer services. So I'm, I'm saying it against our, my own interest, but because that means that uh, yeah, uh, it, we could no, be I'm exaggerating sure. that. So, but it's not, it's not, on the other hand, I can say, it's not the, the story that, well, they, they have nothing better to do and they go into low skill activity. It's true that producer services is even more skilled, but that's also a very small part. And in quantitative sense, it doesn't, it doesn't account for much. But Michael maybe has more interesting things to say. Yeah, no, no. I, I... I don't want to add anything. I think it's, it's exactly right. Like the, the consumer services are much a low skilled relative to the lawyers and the producer services, but relative to the population as a whole, you know, they're positively selected if you, if you, if you want. So. I see. Um, Rachel. Okay. So um, let me ask the first question, which is more straightforward, which is what you touch on at the end where you say the productivity growth in the consumer service will lead to the decline in agriculture. And the interpretation you gave was through income effect, meaning that they have higher income and therefore they go out of agriculture. What I miss is when you were using that general class of preferences, when you estimate what is the elasticity across agriculture and consumer services? Because that statement seemed to implicitly suggest they are subs subs their growth substitute instead of the complement that many of us using so that was the first question and then i asked yeah so sorry i may, maybe maybe i misspoke so what we mean is you know there is our model has a feature of non-homophoticities and price effects in the following sense that holding income constants a, 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 a change in the price of consumer services a, a, you know a higher price of consumer service lowers demand but higher incomes increases the demand for consumer services the income effect is the is the, the demand elasticity, which we estimate to be around 0.3. So this is roughly similar to what um, I estimated in earlier work for the US. And I think it's also, um, you know, if Marti is still here, uh, I think it's, it's also in the ballpark of, of Mar what, what, uh, what Marti and co-authors estimate on, on the Indian data. It's lower than what you would need to match the time series, uh, time series part. So this in, that, that's what the cross-sectional income elasticity is. Now for the elasticity of substitution, I would need to get back to you about this because you know, with the Piggle preference is not that there is like a number, which, so you know, I would need to give you a little bit, I need to work it out what this exactly is, but, but, but I could give you a number. What's the elasticity of substitution between say producer service, uh, consumer services and agriculture for say the median income range or something. But I, I, we should calculate that. I, I don't know what the answer is exactly. Okay. And to, to clarify, to strengthen one point, uh, this is, you no, know, in our model, there is both structural change has both uh, uh, demand driven and uh, technology driven. So, you know, the PIGO allows us in a, you know, in a structural way, but also in a way that is uh, uh, governed by, by the micro data, you know, it tells us how much the income, how much income effect we believe in. And then given that income effect, then we have the uh, the effect of differential technical progress. So there is a bit of, uh, you know, your and the guy is, uh, uh, although we have different technology and different preferences, and at the same time, there is the non-homotheticity. And we are trying to say how much homotheticity we believe in by putting in these preferences. 
Thank you. So my other question, I, I think Fabrizio touched on, maybe it's just my understanding. When you are talking about productivity growth, you mean real productivity growth, right? And so how, how but, you know, when you think about these relative price, they must be growing quite differently across region. And, you know, there's also uh, living cost is very different. So how do we think about comparing real productivity growth across these regions? Yeah. Good. Um, so, you know, in the, we use only information on one price. We only use an information on the tradable price between agriculture and manufacturing. And that is only to kind of basically decompose aggregate growth into a piece that comes out of manufacturing versus agriculture. Otherwise, we don't use any other prices in the, in, in the model, uh, in, in our analysis. So, you know, for consumer services, we think, you know, if you want to be consistent with the theory, I, it would be hard for me to even come up with a price that you would measure precisely because it's non-tradable, as you highlight, you would need to find something for each location. And again, we wouldn't even know, I think, how we do exactly the quality adjustment, et cetera. So for the price of consumer service productivity, there is no observable data counterpart. That's really what we infer exactly from the, uh, from the sort of uh, you know, market clearing conditions. So in that sense, when we say productivity, we literally mean real productivity as like an outward shift of the production possibilities frontier, which is sector and region specific, and which, you know, uh, uh, which apparently grew much faster in urban locations. Now, I should say, we do this in the paper, we didn't have much time to talk about this, but, you know, one big reason why urban locations are the most are the beneficiaries of productivity growth and consumer services, not only that they had more of it, it's also that richer people live there and they spend a lot of money on it. In these rural locations, if you spend 90% of your budget on food, you know, even if consumer service productivity goes up, the welfare effect of that is small because you spend very little on it. In urban locations, we see, uh, we, we, you know, that's why these welfare effects are larger. So consumer services, precisely because they have these non-homotheticities, they are going to be pro-rich and they are going to be pro-urban, both through the preferences and through the fact that our model estimates tell us that productivity growth in urban locations was particularly fast. I have three more questions. I'd really like to hear oh. all of them. So Tarin, uh, then Doug, and yeah. That these two and then I check the service. Okay, so um, quickly following up on the city phenomenon um, that uh, that you pointed out. So I think what you were just saying is that it's the composition of who's in the cities that's really important. But I'm wondering whether the you know what you think about just market size being important for for what's going on in the cities. Like it's just the fact that there's a lot more people there as well. I don't know if that's somewhere in your model. It, it's it's definitely not in the model but it's uh, along the lines we've been thinking. So I would think, you know, if one wanted to now maybe write down a theory that tries to tell us, you know, what, you know, how could we write down a model of productivity and growth and consumer services, you know, probably the first model I would go to would be one where, uh, you know, there is sort of these market services, they're gonna be provided that's going to be provided by a restaurant, by a retail store, by like a service to cleaning. And, you know, if there's any sort of fixed cost to provide these, you know, you need a particular market, you need at least, you know, as we know now from the COVID-19 in New York, you need at least 20 people sitting on the outdoor patio to make it work. So there's nothing about this in our theory, uh, sorry, in, in, in our methodology and our data but we weren't surprised, let's put it this way, that you know, high population density and, and, and urbanization is a corollary of, of high productivity in consumer services. If I can add something, to, you know, to sharp, just to sharpen the same, the same point, uh, we would not have a model because we decided not to or because we, we weren't, uh, but, but, but it would be captured by our estimation. So we would see that in these cities, the productivity goes up a lot, and you would say, well, one of the reasons might be economies of agglomeration. And we right. are sympathetic, certainly, with that, with that view of the world. But somehow, our accounting framework would, would tell you, yeah, there is a big increase in uh, very uh, agglomerated places. Right. I have Doug. 
Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, super interesting. I have a question that's really about the data and about the division in between producer and consumer services, really thinking about informality in the informal sector. It just strikes me there are a lot of people in the informal services sector or just think small scale services, never mind formality to keep from confusing things, who might tell you that they're not servicing firms, but who are providing, let's say, transport services to farmers or to small shopkeepers, people who are moving around small quantities of goods, or people doing processing um, in, in grain milling, agro-processing, where if you ask them whether they're doing this for firms or if you looked in your data, I'm just, I'm wondering whether the form of the data and the way you're, you're constructing it doesn't bias you towards the idea that producer services are smaller and less significant than they in fact are. But I just, I'd love to hear you comment on that. Um, let me take this as an opportunity to tell you again exactly how we actually do it because it's exactly very related to this extent to which what, what do we know what these firms do so we measure producer services by using this survey data on service firms in India and so what do we know from these service firms we know where they are in which district we know their size we know in which sector they are and importantly we they report you know, the share of their activity, which they uh, sell to consumers versus to firms. So ideally, we would want to do the following. We want to, the, the, you know, our original idea was to say, we're going to take data from the NSS at the employee level, and we're going to use the firm level data from this survey to try to think about, well, what's the share of employment working in those firms, which they tell us we sell mostly to firms to say, well, these are the people that actually employ services, which are producer service to the sense of our theory. We couldn't quite do it this way, mostly because in this survey, we had 150,000 firms. And so once you cut this up in like industry region cells, there just wasn't, weren't enough firms to tell us exactly, uh, you know, we, we just had like not enough sample. So we combined this with the, economic census where we have 10 million firms in India uh, over all these districts and firm size. And so we essentially say, well, let's try to estimate from the service survey, the extent to which being a producer service firms varies by firm size, right? So there's a strong correlation empirically that bigger firms sell to firms, smaller firms sell to consumers, exactly what Doug said. And then we use this estimated size dependency at each sector level and the firm size distribution from the economic census to predict how much producer versus consumer service firms we have in the data. So finally, we're going to say a location in India, which has only very small firms, is going to have very little producer service employment, together with the fact that, you know, in the NSS, very few people say they work in those sectors where, service, where producer service employment is important. On the other hand, People, you know, a place like Delhi, where firms are larger than the average, we're going to conclude that producer service employment is large. So that, that's just how we, how, we, how we do it. Now, um, to the extent that firms systematically misreport to what extent they make business with firms, I guess we would underestimate the extent to which we, uh, the, to which we account producer services. Now, in the course of this project, you know, we went through many rabbit holes trying to measure producer services, as you can imagine. Uh, and so, you know, we tried also many other ways of using only the occupational information, of using only the industry information. And, you know, we, in, in some sense, in the beginning to almost like our disappointment, we didn't ever find like a big role for producer services, mostly because it's just so hard to get, you know, large enough numbers to make that matter. Um, so that, that would be kind of my assessment but Fabrizio you want to add if you want any, add anything please no because we are getting over time and I, I want to hear uh, Elvisa as a question oh hi um I think I, I already uh, had a, an answer to my question because you mentioned firm size and that would be a sort of proxy to the integration of processes you just mentioned it. but when you presented you mentioned the extended model with the uh, uh, technology effects and you said that uh, the results do not change much so i think i think that makes sense with the firm size uh, explanation that you just made in the okay. other uh, answer but thanks okay yes. Thank you. Thank you. Let me let me actually uh, because I thought this was a very good question when, when you wrote it. You know, 
what Michael has uh, not had uh, the, the, the time to, to talk, and I will not try to do it now in, in one minute, but you know, we have a model that tries actually, the, 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 the part of the model that, uh, about the good producing service, which uh, combines uh, manufacturing worker and producer services, was kind of trying to do what you were saying. So to try to get more of the integration between the service activity and the production activity. And we believe that if we take this model to try to explain what happens in the United States, the role of this uh, uh, increasing uh, share of producer services was, uh, is gonna be much larger. You know, a little to our own disappointment, uh, uh, it didn't show up as much uh, for India. It could be that uh, we are underestimated in the end, the size of the producer service sector. And uh, as Michael said, we have tried to torture the data in many dimensions to try to, <laughs> you know, to see a case in which this was not true. Uh, you know, this is still our conclusion with, with uh, you know, the, our honest conclusion. But, but, you know, part of the theory is precisely designed to uh, capture the notion that the growth of the service is in part uh, a change in the technology of the production of good in which you use less uh, physical resources in the manufacturing sector and producer workers. And uh, on the other hand, you use many more services as input. And so we hope that next time we move to uh, another economy, we will see more action from that side. Thank you.